Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Philip, and it's a pleasure to give this talk here. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about today is based on joint work with Sam Chow. And in a nutshell, what I want to tell you about today, um, I've tried to condense that into an equation. An equation turned out to be this. So my mission for today is to explain this in greater detail. So at the end, I want to tell you what Littlewood's conjecture is, which is this gentleman on the left here. I want to tell you who um, Tatiana van Aden Ehrenfest is, which is this lady here. And um, this gentleman here, you may or may not recognize this is Kronika. And uh, I will relate Littlewood's conjecture, which contains arithmetic or De Fontaine um, information on the left to an entirely analytic quantity, which is the smooth discrepancy that I define in due course and which will appear here on the right hand side, so to speak. Um, and this connects local and global statistics. Um, and let me start to explain things from right to left. So on the right hand side are chronicle sequences and these are natural sequences. I want to convince you of that. And they live on the one dimensional torus T, which is just the unit interval left, closed, right, open. And I will identify this with R mod Z and uh, go between these two notions a number of times back and forth. So chronic sequences are quite simple to observe. So you already encounter them if you just take the torus the one dimensional torus and you just rotate it by an angle alpha. So you look at the map that takes the representative at uh, x plus z and maps it to x alpha plus z. So that's just a rotation by alpha. And I want to keep things really simple. So I will just look at what a rotation does to the origin and it iterates. Look, and it, uh, you also could consider other points and iterates, so you could look at the orbit of other points, but um, that's a bit too complicated for today. So what happens when you look at the orbit of the origin uh, is that you see, okay, the origin get mapped to alpha first. Then the next time you apply the rotation, it gets mapped to two times alpha. And inductively, it's not hard to see that if you iterate this n times, um, the irrational rotation will just map the origin to n times alpha plus z, which you can identify as n times alpha mod one. Um, and n times alpha mod one is called a chronic sequence. And the global statistics that I want to discuss today is very classical. It's just a uniform distribution. So I want to look at the sequence n times alpha mod one, the orbit of the origin under irrational rotation, and see if it spreads around equally among uh, around the, uh, the unit torus. And uniform distribution, just to uh, remind you of, is uh, simply that every uh, every ball, every interval uh, gets its fair share of points. So if you take a general sequence, it doesn't need to be a chronicle sequence, general sequence X with elements Xn, then uh, you would call that sequence uniformly distributed if whenever you fix an interval B um, and you check how many sequence elements you find in this interval, you get asymptotically the volume or the length of the interval times the number of points that you distribute. Um, and you can simply reformulate this by looking at the expected number of points uh, minus the actual number of points. This is what you could reasonably call a local discrepancy. It's local because you have fixed uh, your interval B. And if that local discrepancy turns out to be um, less than the number of points that you look at, so it's little o of n, then the sequence is uniformly distributed if that's true for any uh, interval B. Okay. So this is just the definition of uniform distribution record for your convenience. Um, and what this means for chronicle sequences uh, is 
Well, they are uniformly distributed unless you have a trivial obstruction. So trivial obstruction would be your alpha is a rational number that just means you turn the circle, the torus, um, you know, in a way that, that just makes the orbit periodic. So you have finitely many points and you have no chance to be visiting every interval with the expected number of times, namely its length. Um, but as soon as you're irrational, um, you are equidistributed. And um, there are two simple ways of um, saying this. One is if you're more in favor of a Gothic theory, you may um, consult the literature or you may prove it by hand that this irrational rotation is uniquely ergodic. That means if I look at the orbit of the irrational rotation, I plug it into an indicator function of my uh, interval and I look at the ergodic average, this converges to the spatial average, which just turns out to be the volume. And that's, that's um, yeah, that's it. Or if you're more in favor of Fourier analysis, then um, you expand the indicator function for you analytically and you check it with Wiles criterion. And I mentioned these two perhaps different branches of mathematics, ergodic theory and Fourier analysis, um, because they'll make an appearance later and uh, we'll connect them. Uh, so this is really just um, a warm up for what is to come. So in a number of times, you're not just interested in the convergence of these um, of these counts of your points and intervals in a qualitative way, but you want it quantitatively. You want to know how fast do these averages actually converge um, to, uh, to the expected limit? And to this end, it's, it is reasonable um, to look at what's called the discrepancy, so to speak, the global discrepancy, not just the local one. And the global discrepancy is the worst local discrepancy, so to say. So you take all these local deviations, all the local discrepancies of the actual number of points minus the expected number of points, see how large this is, and take the worst, take the worst interval here. That's called a discrepancy. Um, and people have studied this, um, partly because they wanted to know how fast does the irrational rotation converge to its um, to its limit uniformly, and partly just for its own sake. So it's a very classical quantity. In fact, um, it dates back, well, nearly 100 years. And at the very beginning is a question of van der Korput. Van der Korput in 1935 expected the discrepancy of any one-dimensional sequence is unbounded. And um, this brings me to our second character, uh, Tatiana van Aten Ehrenfest, who in 1945, about 10 years after Van der Korput asked the question, um, answered it. And she proved yes. In fact, the discrepancy is always unbounded. So informally, what this says is if you have your unit interval and you put points into your unit interval, you can never put them so regularly that the discrepancy is bounded. Somewhere along this, uh, along your sequence, you find a large discrepancy and it's unboundedly large. Um, okay. So this begs perhaps another question. Again, make this quantitative. So how large does your discrepancy need to be? How uniformly, how like fairly can you distribute the points just in a one dimensional interval and um, get away with it? What's the best distribution of sequence elements in a one dimensional interval in terms of minimizing the discrepancy? And this turned out to be a surprisingly hard question. Um, we know the answer, but let me just uh, continue with the story a bit. So uh, four years later, um, 
van der Den Enfest improved upon a result, and she supplied a quantitative version of it. So uh, she proved the discrepancy, in fact, is not just unbounded, but um, you find uh, an omega result, and I use omega in the usual meaning. So omega left-hand side, right-hand side means I can find a constant C such that I have for infinitely many values uh, a lower bound of a constant uh, times this right-hand side. So she proved the discrepancy in, as the property that there is some constant so that it's infinitely often some constant times log log, log n over triple log n. Um, and then Klaus Friedrich Roth in 1945 um, improved upon this result with a very influential work. And what he did is he replaced the log log uh, over triple log by the root of a logarithm. Um, this used uh, a very different approach, one that is rooted purely in harmonic analysis. And uh, it's an L2 argument. So the discrepancy, if you just write it down, it's it's a supremum's norm, so to say. It's an L infinity information. And Roth used an L2 information to lower bound it. And I should further say, when Roth was asked what is his best work, he said his work on discrepancy was his best work, not his work on three-time arithmetic progressions, not his work in the Defantine approximation theorem that you know him about. This was this method of um, orthogonal functions that you introduced to prove these kind of results. This was his best work, he thought. And I will go back to this in a higher dimensional theory in just a bit. But for now, I'll just discuss the one dimensional theory a bit further. So. Um, before continuing, let me just explain two basic mechanisms that you could use to for any given sequence and see how can I spot a big irregularity in my sequence? How can I spot, well, a local irregularity for some box? Well, there are two basic things. Either you have an undercount that means you have looked at an interval which has relatively large volume, but no sequence elements. Then your local discrepancy is simply minus volume times the number of points. And if your volume is large, this will be large in absolute value. Um, or alternatively, you could have an overcount that you found, and that means you might have found um, an interval of kind of small value volume Let's say the volume is bounded um, and you find many elements in there. That would have the effect that the local discrepancy um, would be up to some constant, the number of elements that you have found in there. And in order to give you a heuristic idea what you should expect um, for a lower bound for the one dimensional discrepancy, um, let me just focus on the undercount for now and replace everything we don't understand by random quantities. Because um, I'm a staunch believer in the fact that you cannot beat randomness. If I replace the points whose distribution I don't understand by completely random objects, and I see what comes out of it, then this should be more or less the truth. So let me try to find an undercount by using the random model. So I replace all the points xn by random variables capital xn. They're all independent and they should have equal probability of being somewhere in the um, in the unit interval. And um, now I'll just look at capital N many of these random points. And before I do anything, I will order them numerically in size. So that means these points, as you see here, they may come in any order, but it certainly is not the numerical order in general. And I'll give them a second subscript that depends on the number of points that I choose to put them in numerical order. So they unfold them, so to speak. So now you see them here appearing in numerical order. And in order to really do reasonable statistics with these random points, I have to look at what the average gap between them is. 
to see what's going on. And the average gap is, well, that's just the length of these arcs between numerically neighboring points. So you compute the difference of these points. And geometrically, this just means you start walking from the first point to the second, from the second to the third, and so on, until you've walked one time around the circle. So this means the average gap is one over the number of points that you have distributed. And I've put the, the last gap here for consistency, just to be um, a carryover. But that's not too important. Um, so once you've normalized them, you can see how large of a gap can you produce. This will be important to produce a large interval without any points in it. So I've computed the average gap, and now I'll renormalize it to do reasonable statistics with it. It was 1 over n previously, so I multiply it with n. Now the average gap has unit size. And it makes sense to ask for a given interval, what's the probability of finding an element in that interval? So uh, what you can prove, uh, I won't do it for time reasons, is you can take, um, yeah, you, you can show that almost surely these uh, these gaps uh, converge to a possible limit distribution. So if you are interested in checking if a given interval contains a gap, this will converge um, to the uh, integral of e to the minus s over the interval. And if you believe this to be true, and you push it to the limit, you can see what should be the largest gap. Um, so this means we take the count that appears on the left-hand side of the gaps and multiply it through with n, so that's the count, and this should be roughly the integral over the uh, limiting uh, Poisson distribution and if you specialize the gap to be of size log n, you will just render the right-hand side to be about one. So this is to say that you should, if you have a sufficient amount of uniformness in this convergence upstairs, you should expect to find some gap um, of size log n here. And um, yeah, this is not a standard way of approaching this. This is just me um, guessing what the answer should be. So I would guess that the answer here should be um, log n. There should be some renormalized gap of size log n. And um, that turns out to be the truth in one dimension. So um, Schmidt proved that the discrepancy of a one dimensional sequence is always omega of log n. And this was in 1972. Um, he didn't use the random model in any way. This is Schmidt's paper is written in very different wording and um, doesn't use that randomness at all. Um, but um, it gives you an intuition why logarithm should be the right answer, I think. Um, and this is the best kind of lower bound you should be able to establish in general. Um, and you can check this by just looking at the chronicle sequences for quadratic irrational. So I think Ostrovsky and um, contemporaries knew already that the discrepancy of a chronicle sequence is about log n. So that's as low as it gets. Um, so Schmidt's result is optimal and the random model is true. Um, let me now turn to the higher dimensional theory of um, of chronical sequences. So I will generalize things like discrepancy to higher dimensions and everything is just um, tensoring through. So I make the one dimensional interval B now into a D dimensional box. Uh, and I've centered the box at uh, a vector gamma and it has length rho i's here. So, writing the box in this way. And then the local discrepancy with respect to that box is simply the number of sequence elements that you find in the box um, minus the expected number of uh, uh, elements that you would find. So volume times the number of uh, 
sequence elements that you consider, and the discrepancy is similarly just the worst kind of local discrepancy that you find. And again, you can ask the question, so what is the worst, what is, what is sort of the best distribution of points um, that you can possibly have? And that is also to say, what is a, a lower bound on the discrepancy at least? Can we lower bound the discrepancy? Um, because otherwise, if we have found a very good distribution of points, we can't really say that it's the best or that it's close to being optimal. Um, so here is the point where Roth method is really shining uh, very brightly. So it's, it's a wonderful method, really. Um, and Roth proved in D dimensions uh, an omega result for um, the discrepancy of any sequence. So for any sequence, you find an omega of log n to the d halves. And the implied constant uh, that you get in the omega is only depending on the dimension, not on the sequence. Um, so this was first improved by Joseph Beck, just in the two-dimensional case. So if d is equal to two, um, Beck was the first to significantly improve on Roth's result. Um, for d is two, you would, Roth would give you a log n, and Beck could say a log log one over eight minus epsilon. Um, and the only improvement since is somewhere in the 2000s due to uh, Billy Glacier and Vakya Shayaka, who could um, improve on Beck's uh, uh, improvement in arbitrary dimensions, but by replacing the log log term here by a logarithm to some exponent, eta d. So eta d is not explicitly computed in the paper, and it's probably relatively small. Um, but the dependence on the ambient dimension d, so we are d dimensions, and it's basically logarithm to the d halves plus um, some epsilon. That still stands. And all of these results, starting from Roth onwards, they use an L2 method using harmonic analysis and orthogonalities in very clever ways to um, to produce these results. So this causes the exponent naturally to be divided by a two. Um, okay. So um, that's where matters stand. So um, I would be very happy if anyone could improve on these results. Um, but more than that, um, this general theory of discrepancy is useful to, well, lower bound the discrepancy of any sequence, whatever it is. We started this discussion by trying to lower bound the discrepancy um, or estimate the discrepancy of irrational rotations to see how fast they converge to their expected uh, ergodic averages. Um, so if we, um, yeah, maybe one, one final word before we turn to this, uh, the conjecture is in general that in D dimensions you get logarithm to the D. That's the main open question in the area. Um, and I've, I've told you the results towards it. So, but now let me turn back to Kronecker sequences. Um, so we try to analyze their discrepancy as a means to show how fast they converge to the expected averages. And if you specialize the theory to just the discrepancy of Kronecker sequences, um, we're in a better shape actually, um, at least probabilistically. So in the mid nineties, um, Josef Beck looked at the discrepancy of uh, higher dimensional Kronecker sequences, and he could establish that at least almost surely, so for almost every input alpha, the Kronecker sequence n vector alpha mod one has close to the kind of discrepancy you want to see. So a logarithm is raised to the D, and then there is a second order factor. It's some function G of log log N, um, 
and that function G um, is determined by uh, the reciprocal of G of N to converge. So if you figure out by Cauchy condensation when this sum, uh, the series converges, you'll find basically G is about X log X to the one plus minus epsilon, plus is when it converges, minus when it diverges, and that means you can um, almost surely find that the discrepancy of the uh, d-dimensional Kronecker sequence is logarithm uh, of n to the d log log n, and then triple log to some power, and um, triple log to some smaller power for an omega result. So it's, it's a very sharp, very nice uh, result that tells you, okay, the Kronecker sequences are very close to what you would get for the main conjecture. And the main conjecture for the discrepancy to be at least log n to the d. It's just what you get from the one-dimensional case and pretending all the d-dimensions are acting independently. So it's like a random model in d-dimensions that you basically uh, are asking for. And um, let me outline uh, very briefly, how Beck derived his theorem. So the Kronecker sequence being in some box B um, and seeing how much the number of points in a box deviates from the expected term given by the volume, um, that's a lattice point counting problem. And the lattice that you encounter here is uh, simply the lattice lambda sub alpha, where you put um, the condition that the first um, d many uh, alphas that you have are in some box, you put this uh, into the lattice by decoding it by an identity matrix. And then the last coordinate simply keeps track that your small n is at most capital N in size. So naturally, your d dimensional sequence lives in a d plus one dimensional lattice. And you try to control this lattice point counting problem. Now, um, you can write it out as lattice point as in an indicator function, but that's a bit unpleasant to approach. So what you do is you smooth the indicator function, which you can do by only losing a small uh, set of alphas. Um, and then um, you use Fourier analysis, which is guided by uh, what Beck calls a local to global principle. So the idea is the global irregularity, so anything that sort of is messed up globally in the distribution of these chronicle sequences, they can only come from one source, and that's the local irregularity. So things that happen at much, much smaller scales. Um, and you can guess this already in one dimension. So if you have a local irregularity, let's say in the language that I used before, so you have an, an overcount. So you have a small box with many, many elements. Such a thing arises if you take your number uh, alpha and you find a good approximation, n naught. So n naught alpha mod one is not just less than one over n naught, but by some epsilon. Mm -hmm. So you have a tiny interval you found uh, around the origin and you want one point in there. Then you can define a scale capital N naught, which is um, just this good approximation denominator N naught that you have found times the scale in epsilon to the minus a half. And then you can check that you actually have found many intervals, uh, sorry, many points in this small interval because uh, by finding one, you can just take multiples and you can take multiples for a while um, to be quantitative. The while is epsilon minus two half, say, and um, all these epsilon to the minus a half multiples will be in this interval. Um, and therefore you've just found a lot of points in an interval that is so short that it shouldn't have much points to begin with. So you have created a local irregularity and certainly a local irregularity. When you take sort of the worst global irregularity, the local irregularity are certainly counted in there. But the substance of this statement is there is basically no more 
it's only the local ones which determine the global behavior. Um, but this was more of a philosophy in the paper. Um, it is a qualitative statement and not something you, you find a precise statement how to make it quantitative. So that's, that's what I will state later on. This will be the main result that Sam and I found. We found a very clear correspondence between the local and the global irregularities for the chronicle sequences. And in order to explain this a bit more, let me, let me explain a bit more about um, the local irregularities or local statistics. And for the chronicle sequences, this is simply known as Diofantine approximation. And the cornerstone of Diofantine approximation is Dirichlet's theorem. So Dirichlet's theorem says, whatever your vector alpha is that you're working with, and whatever your scale capital N is that you're looking at, there exists some point small n, um, so that you can make all the coordinates in your chronicle sequences pretty close to the origin. So the double bars here and throughout my talk, there will be the distance to the nearest integer. So what I'm saying here is you are making all the coordinates n alpha, uh, n alpha i pretty close to the origin, that's what the maximum does. And how close can you make them? You can make them n to the one over d close. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether you get capital or a bit uh, or smaller n here, get both. And um, just very briefly to remind you, this is something you can again just deduce by looking at this lattice lambda alpha and then applying Minkowski's theorem Minkowski's first theorem to it, um, and um, you just write down the appropriate box that comes out of the statement. Uh, and that's all it is, really. So Dirichlet's theorem tells us we can always find some element in a chronicle sequence by any given scale, which is sort of close to the origin in the sense of the distance to the nearest integer, which is the natural notion of distance on the d-dimensional torus of each coordinate. Um, so maybe in terms of producing local irregularities, you may wonder if this theorem of Dirichlet has such a simple proof, maybe we could just do better by working harder. Maybe there's just a smarter way of, of doing the approximation and you can improve upon Dirichlet's theorem, and then you could prove a better lower bound, possibly for the discrepancy, because you've produced local irregularities. Um, and that's just wrong. So Dirichlet's theorem is optimal. You cannot improve it, aside from by constant, because there are numbers, alpha, which are badly approximable. They are precisely um, those numbers of vectors, which um, have the property, well, that Dirichlet's theorem can be not improved by more than a constant. And you can show that the set is actually non-empty. Uh, it has full host of dimension, but zero Lebesgue measure. And the vectors inside this set are called badly approximate vectors. And the essence of what I'm going to say from here on out is if you can find badly approximable vectors in a multiplicative sense. So you can write this set of badly approximable vectors down and just replace mechanically all the plus signs by multiplication. And then, okay, you also replace this factor of n to the one over d by n, because otherwise you could just apply one dimensional Dirichlet and, and make this uh, small. Um, and the big question is, what does this set of badly multiplicatively approximate vectors do? First of all, it's simple to see that it has to be contained in, um, in the product of one-dimensionally badly approximable vectors, uh, numbers. So each coordinate of i has to be badly approximable for the lim inf to have just Can a I chance. Can I get two chicken breasts and these two? Okay, I'll continue. Um, 
So this is clear. So badly approximable numbers in one dimension are uh, a Lebesgue null set. So this means the badly approximable, multiplicatively badly approximable vectors, if they exist at all, they're a null set too. And um, the main question um, about them goes back to Littlewood. And Littlewood was wondering if they exist at all. Um, rather, he was thinking they don't. So starting from dimension two onwards, um, they they just shouldn't exist. Clearly in dimension one, badly approximate numbers exist and they two notions just coincide and therefore they exist in one dimension, but not from two onwards. Um, and we don't know that much about it, but there's some, some things that we do know. So we don't know it's empty. We don't know that Lewis conjecture, but um, Einstein, Lekatok, and Lindenstrauss um, established in the 2000s that the multiplicatively badly approximable um, vectors have house of dimension zero. In fact, box counting, box counting dimension zero. Um, and uh, uh, Annie Pollington, um, who I also see here in the audience, and Sandro Villani, um, they established also in the 2000s that, in fact, you should ex you get even more than Littlewood um, on a large set. So whenever you fix the first component of your badly approximable um, of your vector, alpha 1, take that to be a badly approximable number to have a chance to produce a counterexample to Littlewood, then there is a set of um, alpha 2 second component of your vector, which also are badly approximable, and they're drawn from a set of full host of dimension, that you not only get little wood, you get little wood by logarithm of leeway. So you get infinitely many solutions um, to this little wood product being less than one over logarithm of n. And you can, you can actually make another random heuristic, a random model that I don't have time to get into, that would have you believe that this is just generally true. Littlewood should be true by logarithm of leeway. Um, this is in fact a conjecture of uh, Dimitri Batsyakhin and uh, Sandra Villani. Um, okay, so leaving that aside, I've, I've now talked about very different things, um, at least on the surface. I've talked about sort of these global um, questions like equidistribution and then discrepancy of chronicle sequences. So this, this is like one part of the story. This is a equidistribution as a global concept. And then the Fontaine approximation, which really has to do with approximating numbers and vectors by rationals. Um, and approximating them in very, very tiny regions. So it's a highly localized um, statistic that we're looking at. And um, I'll spend the rest of the talk telling you, although they look different on the surface, they actually turn out to be the same. Um, and in order to do that, to state our result, I will introduce a smoothing to all I've said before. So I will define a smooth uh, discrepancy by smoothing in all um, the variables. Uh, so the variables for the sequence and plus one for the uh, number of elements that we're looking at. And uh, I will be um, defining a class GK of good weight functions, omega. And these omegas are just um, taking the role of the indicator functions really. So. They, they map um, each omega i that I'm using to smooth the i-th coordinate is mapping r to, uh, to r plus. It's a smooth function. It doesn't need to be smooth. We actually get away with less, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll just assume it's smooth. Um, and it's supported in minus two, two, uh, two. And I also wanted to act nicely on Fourier space so I'm asking the Fourier transform of omega i to be positive as well. Um, you can easily construct 
such omega i's, you just take an even function. An even function has a real valued uh, Fourier transform, and then you convolve it, that even function with itself. Convolution turns into multiplication for your space, and that will force the Fourier transform to be positive. So these conditions are easy to meet, really, and they're natural. Um, and once you have such a weight, um, you take any box, you renormalize the box that you're given, the side length r of i, it's centered at gamma. So in order to smooth this properly, I center um, the local discrepancy of a Kronecker sequence that I define here. I center this at gamma i, I localize to, it to the scale rho i, um, and I do this in each coordinate separately, where the last coordinate, which keeps track of the um, number of elements that I consider plays a special role because it's just not shifted. Um, and then you subtract the number of expected um, elements in here. So that gets weighted with the product of the uh, Fourier transforms just to account and normalize properly. And then you define the smooth discrepancy of the Kronecker sequence simply as before, it's, it's the worst local discrepancy. And to state the results, I need to introduce the height of a, uh, a vector. So I take a multiplicative height where the height um, is simply the product of the coordinates, except when the coordinates are less than one, then I replace this by one. So this is a standard height here. And um, the first result in our local to global principle is an upper bound. So this takes a local and basically non-existence of a local irregularity. So that means you can uh, you start by taking a vector which is not too well approximable and not too well approximable is quantified by this lower bound um, on the distance of the nearest integer of the inner product alpha times n. Um, so this is an absence of local irregularities an absence of local irregularities should lead to an absence of global irregularities. So we get an upper bound on the discrepancy. But um, to our surprise, it isn't quite that straightforward. So there's a funny function L that comes in when you actually establish this upper bounds. And that function L just naturally comes out of the geometry of the problem. Uh, I'll say a few words on this in a second. So this function L is implicitly defined. Take your function B that lower bounds the different the nature of your vector. Um, and L of X is simply defined by the equation L of X by L of X is X. And then the upper bound on the discrepancy that you get is not merely phi, it's phi of L of N, which we didn't expect before. Um, if your phi is, is very slowly growing, so for almost every alpha, you would expect phi to be a log power, then this function phi L of n is just phi. Uh, the L doesn't change that much, but if phi starts to grow a little faster, phi L of n is genuinely different than phi of n. And this theorem is true, and provided the phi is actually not too wildly varying. So as long as you know that phi of 2x is upper bounded by phi of x, meaning phi is a doubling function, um, we get to draw this conclusion. So this is the part of the local to global principle where we say, okay, the absence of a local irregularity forces a global um, a, 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 a certain quality on the goodness of the global distribution. And um, the fact of the matter is this is optimal. So we have a matching lower bound which says, okay, if you actually have found many local irregularities, so if you found many good Defontein approximations of the quality, let's say phi, um, and you define L in the same way, then you find global irregularity. So this will produce a lower bound, which is matching here, um, phi L of n as a lower bound on the discrepancy. And um, 
I have, um, uh, yeah, I, I just want to mention actually, when you combine these two theorems, what you find is that you can rephrase Littlewood's conjecture. So Littlewood would, uh, let me explain it maybe with a counterexample to Littlewood. Um, a counterexample to Littlewood, uh, as one can show by transference, means you could the function phi here could be taken to be a bounded function. It's just a constant, really. Uh, so this would mean you take a constant function up here, and this theorem, because constants are doubling, constant functions are trivially doubling, um, this theorem tells you actually the smooth discrepancy of this Kronecker sequence is just flatly bounded. There's just no lower bound on it. Uh, and remember, all the lower bounds we discussed for the classical discrepancy, they were going to infinity, you know, Ehrenfest theorem. Um, so that in mind, you can reformulate Littlewood's conjecture as the statement that any two-dimensional Kronecker sequence has an unbounded smooth discrepancy. And if you actually keep book of how much smoothness you need, you get away with C3. So it's, in simple terms, if you smooth just a little bit, then the fun on the Ehrenfest theorem becomes Littlewood's conjecture. Fun on the Ehrenfest just for Kronecker sequences. And the picture I showed you there in the very beginning um, was just trying to capture that. And the stars in between were convolutions to indicate that if you smooth, um, uh, two times you get C3 smoothness. So this is exactly the statement you get out of this. So let me use the remaining minutes to just sketch the proofs um, a little bit. So um, let me sketch the proof of the upper bound, in fact. So there are naturally two distinct cases to analyze. There is a case that the box has tiny volume and in that case, we do basically two things. One is inflation and is the geometry of numbers. So inflation means if your box is super, super tiny, um, you find a box P dash with the property that it contains your original box and has some amount of volume. And the amount of volume you will need at the end of the day is phi L of N, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. um, and how can you connect the discrepancy of the inflated box to the original box? Well, you define um, the smooth weight uh, as something for transparency reasons, just W of the box. It's some positive quantity the way we arranged it. And that means we can control um, the undercount part, so to say. We can control for local discrepancy um, this quantity from below by just throwing away the positive part. So the counting goes away. This is just the negative part here. And you can also control this from above by just throwing away the volume term, which gets subtracted. So it's just the counting part. And you can inflate the volume in the lower bound. Um, and doing so will basically will, um, deliver the following bound. So you can bound the smooth discrepancy of a tiny box by the unsmooth discrepancy of a slightly bigger box with a bit of volume and the volume term, which I've inflated here. Um, so you're just left with the classical discrepancy of an inflated box. But what I said about uh, Beck's theorem, this is a lattice point counting problem in fact. And this is where we use the geometry of numbers to actually you, uh, deduce sharp bounds for this um, for this lattice point counting problem. Um, of course, using our Defantin assumption here, um, and this is what throws in this function L of n actually ferrier L of n. This is comes out of the geometry of numbers in a in a very nice way. So um, let me now turn to the large boxes. So the large boxes are boxes where you have at least a little bit of volume to work with. And that means um, it is reasonable to try for your analytic means to analyze them. So bearing in mind that we have a smooth count here, we can use Potter summation 
to um, write a smooth count over the lattice that we are counting points in, um, in terms of the um, Fourier transform of the counting function, and this will involve the dual lattice. So I'll just wrap up in a minute. Um, and uh, if you plug this into the local discrepancy, this means you have subtracted in the local discrepancy um, just the zero mode. So the zero of the dual lattice will cancel out with the volume term that, that you have in the local discrepancy. And you're just asked to understand the Fourier transform of your count over the non-zero lattice points. And we do this by uh, using uh, the Fanta gap principle. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention.